Welcome to the Zenov Podcast. You're listening to our Business Resilience Series, where we bring to you conversations between eminent industry stalwarts and thought leaders from across the globe as they discuss their insights on overcoming challenges and the mindset that helps them navigate the journey of crisis, resilience, and growth. Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Zeno podcast in our Business Resilience series. I'm your host, Siddhant. I'm a president at Zenov, a leading management consulting organization. Today, I have the wonderful privilege of hosting Professor Mohan Beer Sohni, who is an acclaimed author, a teacher, and one of the world's foremost experts in digital transformation and business innovation. Professor Sohni is currently with the McCormick Foundation, Chair of Technology at the Kellogg School of Management at the Northwest University. He has published multiple papers. He has written several books. His pioneering research, especially on emerging technology and how these technologies are disrupting these industries and forcing companies to rethink their business models has made him an advisor to numerous Fortune 500 companies globally. Professor Sony and his advice is sought after by multiple companies, especially on the marketing side, on the e-commerce side. And he has he serves on boards of multiple leading technology companies that are working to shape the future of how we live. So, Professor Sony, welcome. Uh, we are very thrilled to have you today. Uh, thank you, Siddhant, for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you on this podcast. Thank you, Professor. So, Professor, let's get started. The first area I wanted to discuss with you And uh, it's related to the extensive work that you have in terms of digital innovation across different sectors. The first thing I would like to look at is your perspective on AI, generative AI, or just overall automation. So from the academic world, you have a unique vantage point to look at multiple industries, multiple technology leaders, and these are the companies and the people that you engage with. What is your perspective on the usage of AI or generative AI across industries and how certain leaders seem to be at a forefront of adopting it or not? So the AI uh, revolution has been going on for some time. We used to call it machine learning and then uh, it evolved into deep learning applications uh, for image, speech and text processing. And more recently, uh, we have seen the evolution of generative AI, which of course uses deep learning, but it, it, it is able to generate new artifacts, new content. Uh, so a lot of the excitement uh, in the past year and a half has been around generative AI, but we have to see generative AI in the context of the broader revolution of automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning applications, which has been going on for almost 20 years now. So uh, let me talk about a perspective of breadth and depth. So breadth is sort of where the use cases are and what industries will be impacted. And depth is the level of adoption and current implementation of uh, AI algorithms and uh, use cases. So from a breadth standpoint, I think this technology is very far reaching. It is very secular in its impact. I I, I can't think of an industry that would not be affected. Uh, But when you look at generative AI, The important uh, distinction there is that generative AI really shines when a human is interacting with a machine. So any human-facing applications uh, are the uh, sweet spot for generative AI. So generative AI, I I think, will be very useful for, say, the legal services industry, for creative services, wherever there's content generation, content analysis, summarization, information extraction knowledge management. That's sort of in terms of the breadth. Now, where are companies in terms of the adoption? I think it's still in the infancy stage, still the early stage. Now, traditional machine learning applications, of course, uh, are being used quite extensively, more by the digital natives. If you think of companies like an Airbnb or a Uber and so on, they've been using machine learning for a very, very long time and literally have thousands of applications, even in the financial services, right? fraud detection, medical claims management, and so on. In the generative AI front, we're still seeing experimentation and early stages. We have not seen the production scale use. We're still a little bit short of the productionization because there are a lot of issues related to 
making sure that the data that you have is unbiased, is representative, but also making sure you're dealing with data privacy issues and all the other challenges. And these algorithms and models are still mm -hmm. sort of in their infancy stage. So putting guardrails around it, making sure you have proper governance. Uh, so those are some of the issues that are holding back the broader deployment of uh, generative AI. But I expect these issues to be sorted out by the end of uh, this year and 2025 will be the year where uh, we'll start to see production scale generative AI applications. Excellent. Great points you had, uh, Professor. One of the things I really liked is when you said that uh, it's human interaction where generative AI really shines. You actually create courses for the C-suite. Uh, you're interacting with them at the exec level, exec coaching level especially. Can you give us a good example that is a brilliant way for the C-suite to leverage AI in doing their own work more efficiently. Yeah, that is a, a good observation that generative AI not only helps an enterprise in the way that uh, you interact with customers, mm -hmm. in the way that you engage with your external constituents, but it also helps in your day-to-day -day work. And I think mm -hmm. that is low-hanging fruit. That's where you have to think about literally a hundred little ways that every executive should be using generative AI. In fact, I, I like to say that today you should never start work without a chat GPT window or whatever your favorite LLM is open by your site. That's why they call it co-pilot. It's assisting you, whether it's drafting emails or summarizing a document or uh, managing meetings, right? Meeting summaries. So it's your day-to-day -day productivity can be enhanced a lot, managing your internal workflows, prioritizing your schedules. So increasingly we will see, Siddhant, the embedding of co-pilots into every application, right? Of course, Microsoft is embedding co-pilot into your productivity applications. Salesforce is embedding co-pilot into all of its applications, marketing cloud, sales cloud, and so on. Uh, let me give you a specific example. I was with a company last week, a company called PlanView. PlanView mm -hmm. builds software that allows you to manage very complex IT portfolios. Yeah. So if you've got hundreds of projects, you can see how those projects are doing and what is the velocity and the flow and what are the problems. So they built a co-pilot application and that co-pilot application, you can go in as the CIO or the head of IT or portfolio management and say, what should I be worried about? And they'll say, this project is connected to that project and it is being delayed because the team is working more on defects. And so it sits on top of your project management software like Jira and so on. And it will reassign teams and is able to look across projects and guide you by querying your data. So another quick example of this, Mars, Mars Corporation, which Wrigley Mars, they make candy. They have built something, Siddhant, that they call Snacking GPT. So Snacking wow. GPT is a model that is trained on their data and if a salesperson is going to visit Walmart the bar next week, they're like, what promotions have we been running with Walmart? Which of these have been profitable? What is the next uh, promotion that I should offer them? You're going for a sales call. You can ask, what does this account need? What is the most likely thing that they're going to buy from us next? The, the breakthrough here is you can now have conversations with your data. This is really the idea of democratizing analytics, democratizing machine learning, democratizing AI and bringing it to the fingertips of C-suite. That's why I think the C-suite is so excited about generative AI because until now, AI has been the preserve of data scientists, right? It, it, it needs skill, it needs coding, it needs expertise in algorithms. But now I can build apps by speaking in English. Excellent. I really like what you said about how Gen AI gives voice to data, allows it to speak, and how it has democratized it. So, uh, Professor, one of the things that I, I was very curious to pick your brain on is uh, most of the C-suite, especially in the technology world or technology businesses, they are grappling with so-called breakthrough technology every six months. Right. And all of these technologies, uh, barring a few, may be really important for the company to keep in pace with. But how do you advise the CXOs in terms of this change management? Uh, is there a certain percentage of time that they need to dedicate to this or how do they prioritize between the different areas? I think on the uh, first observation I want to make is that technology implementation and adoption is kind of the easy part. It's mm. the people and change management that's the most challenging because as you put in new systems, as you put in new AI applications, it 
changes the way people work and behave. It changes the skills that are needed. By the way, there will be a lot of job displacement. There will be reskilling and upskilling required. Really a chain management project. It's a people management project. It's a process project. So from that standpoint, as a business leader, you have to actually start with culture and mindset creating that culture of agility and change and also sort of this idea of creating a learning organization where people are incentivized to actually learn to adapt and have what Satya at Microsoft calls a beginner's mind, right? Sort of constantly learning, constantly adapting. And by the way, that has to start from the top. And this is my core message to business leaders is get immersed, play with the tools yourself. There's a difference between brainstorming and body storming, right? Brainstorming is an intellectual, body storming is experiencing it yourself. So you have to get familiar with the tool, you have to lead from the front. There is a expression in Punjabi that says, Aap na marie swarg na jaye, right? Which means if you want to see heaven, you have to die yourself. Experience it. <laughs> so, so I think that is the idea. So because I like to say that the actions of leaders cast very long shadows. Everyone's watching you. So you can say that we want to be an AI first company. You can say that we want to be innovative and do digital transformation, but they're going to look at, are you voting with your time? Are you voting with your dollars? Are you voting with your attention? So time, money, attention, those are the uh, critical assets that a leadership team has. So in companies that are moving faster, that are more receptive to change, I see this at the board level, at the leadership mm-hmm. level. By the way, it doesn't mean you have to be a technology expert. No, what it means is that you need to be supportive. You need to understand conceptually and viscerally what this change involves and then create a culture where people are incentivized to not do the same thing over and over again. And that's the big challenge. And by the way, this has nothing to do with the size of the company. Even This is a myth that only small companies can be agile. Some of you might know I've I've been on the board of Reliance Geo for 10 years. And the company is over 100,000 people, but it is extremely agile. So that's a very important lesson. Yeah. So, Professor, I think I can relate to the examples. We've been working with Geo as well, and Microsoft is one of our largest customers for a very long time. Not as long as yours, but at least a couple of decades. So I can totally relate to that. One of the most important things you you mentioned, uh, Professor, is uh, how a company need not have episodes of adoption or episodes of change management. But if you have a culture of agility, a culture of learning, that would solve a lot of the generic issues that people have in terms of change. The other point that you mentioned is a lot of things are changing. The skills required are going to be different. So there is one area where all of these skills and reskillings is being applied at a company level. And I'm sure you are at the forefront of this with many of the uh, large enterprises that you're working. The second is on the students that you are on a day-to-day basis, you are teaching them, right? I want to touch upon both these areas. So on the corporate side, what is it that you are advising them uh, in terms of looking at the skills, the talent, shaping the overall corporate talent for the future? And secondly, on your students, what are you teaching them in terms of how they can adopt or adapt to this more rapidly? So let me combine these two questions into sort of a broader question. And that is, what will be the skills? What will be the capabilities uh, of the future? Because, you know, corporations are end users of these capabilities. Universities are producers of the talent. So Mm -hmm. the question is still the same. What kind of talent will be needed? And what kind of talent will actually be less relevant? So if you look at what generative AI does, I like to say that you will never start any problem, any day, any proposal, anything that you want to do with a blank page, you will have the tool available to you to do the first 50, 60, 70% of the work. So you start at 70, but now the value that you add in that 30 is what matters. And what is that value? It's the ability to query prompt engineering capabilities, it's strategic thinking, it's pattern recognition, it's ability to ask the right questions. So those critical skills, those sort of prompt engineering skills, those querying skills, those pattern recognition skills, becoming more of an architect as opposed to the implementer will be more valuable because you will be freed up from doing mundane work. It will surface up for you, the higher order skills. So for instance, two days ago, I was in Florida 
and I was on a panel with one of my students, former students. She runs all of the AI and software portfolio for Philips in their medical. It's a half a billion dollar business. And uh, what Madhuri was telling me was that today, if you look at the use of AI and imaging, the workload for radiologists is very high and there's burnout. And it's a very tedious job looking at scans and, and 95% of the scans are normal. So mm. AI now moves that 95% away and then says, these are the 5% where we need human judgment. Not only is their work less tedious, but it is more rewarding because now I'm only looking at the challenging cases and I'm actually using more human judgment. So I think AI doesn't replace humans, it augments. I like to say that A should stand for augmented intelligence or assisted intelligence, not artificial intelligence. So particularly when you're talking about life and death decisions, mission critical decisions like medical diagnosis, you will need the human judgment. But that human judgment is now aided by algorithms that will remove some of the tedium. It's the same thing with law firms. There's a firm that I work with that has created algorithms for automated contract reviews. So they do the same thing. You take a 100-page agreement and it'll say 98% is okay, but you focus on this clause and this clause, which seem to be non-standard. So that reduces the time that lawyers need to look at the agreement by 87%. But that 13% is higher value work. So let me give you a very funny analogy that people in India will really understand. What generative AI is, it is the quota factory of business. What that means is that when people prepare for the IIT exam, they all go to quota. If you don't go to quota, there's no way you're going to get in. But if you do go to quota, then you've just come to the same level as everybody else. And now you have to compete. Everybody's at 70. But now that 30 is what matters. It's the human, the creativity, the synthesis, the prompt engineering, the and that is something also that I'm teaching. So I'm actually incorporating generative AI tools into all of my product management classes. We'll teach them the specific tools, the tools for persona, tools for customer journey mapping, tools for wireframing. So I really want to make sure that this becomes part of the fabric of their work and not something exotic that data scientists do. Because I think that we will truly have achieved adoption and use of generative AI when it just becomes part of the flow of our day-to-day -day work. Excellent, Professor. Professor, I think you've given us a new terminology. We've all heard about 80-20 rule. You gave us a 70-30 rule now. <laughs> Where 70 is hygiene. You called it hygiene, augmented intelligence. And 30 is where you put your own mind, uh, your own prompt engineering skills, your strategic thinking, pattern recognition. I think that's that's some great advice to both corporate leaders and also the students that are Right. Hoping to make it big in this world. Great. One final question, Professor. Recently, we had uh, Microsoft CEO coming to India talking about how India is going to be the foremost in terms of talent for generative AI. Uh, at the same time, uh, Professor, what is your viewpoint on the role of India in the future of this technology or global technology ecosystem? If you um, look at the landscape in India, clearly the the breadth and depth of technical talent that uh, India has is, uh, is unmatched, right? even in, unmatched by China. So we have a wealth of natural resources or human resources, and that is the critical asset uh, nowadays. So I think the future is very bright. There's a lot of innovation. Uh, in fact, we've been looking at the landscape and I am amazed to see over 100 generative AI startups in India, a variety of people solving lots of interesting problems. But a few observations I want to make about uh, India. So if you look at the generative AI stack, there are three layers, right? You have the infrastructure layer at the bottom, which includes compute, right? So that's your NVIDIA and Azure and AWS, sort of the data centers and the infrastructure. Then you have the platform layer, which is the language models. And this is where the open AIs and Hugging Face and all these companies and so on fit in. And then you have the application layer, which includes enterprise software companies like Salesforce, Adobe, but also a bunch of really interesting mm -hmm. apps. So if you look at these three layers of the stack, there's an orders of magnitude of capital intensity as you go down the stack. So at the infrastructure level, it is very capital intensive, right? If you, you need right. billions of dollars. So that will be highly consolidated. And that will be just a very few number of companies can play in that space. And I think that the opportunity in India to build that kind of scale from a capital standpoint is limited. I think the only companies mm -hmm. that have a stab at it actually are companies like Geo, because we have right. such enormous capital investment in infrastructure. 
I think for India, the sweet spot is in the other two layers. On the platform layer, there's a lot of really interesting opportunities to build foundation models for the Indian context, which require language. So in fact, there's a company we will be visiting in Bangalore called Sarvam.ai. And Sarvam.ai mm-hmm. is building vernacular language specific LLMs. So there's, there's opportunity at the platform level, but the really interesting opportunity at the application layer where India has not only a lot of talent, but it also has really large problems. So you have large yes. problems and the ability to tackle them. So I think that India will lead in coming up with India specific applications for at least three or four big areas, education, healthcare, financial services, agriculture. I think these are these domains where the scale and scope of the problems are huge. So for example, early diagnostic services for healthcare right? or e-learning, custom e-learning applications, personalized e-learning applications. So, so I think there's just a ton of opportunity there. So I don't think that Indian companies should be copying the open AIs and Microsofts of the world, but they should be charting their own course, building applications and solutions for problems that affect 1.4 billion people and potentially also for the world. Wow. Excellent, Professor. I think those were some uh, brilliant perspectives. Thank you so much. And if I were to quickly summarize the the top highlights of what we discussed, the first point you mentioned was in terms of how generative AI really shines where human interaction is involved. Mm -hmm. So it's important when the C-suite is looking at where to uh, apply Gen AI, that they think of this consciously and use that as the prioritization matrix. Second thing, from a personal note to each of the CXOs, you mentioned that you cannot start your day without having an AI assistant. You called it body storming, right? And that was an excellent way of describing it. Uh, The other thing that you mentioned is why generative AI is so uh, popular or will become very important going forward is because it is giving voice to data. It is democratizing the ability to look, view, and decipher data. And finally, when we spoke about how companies need to manage the different technology changes or different technologies coming about, you gave a management lesson in saying that it's not about trying to manage technology, but trying to manage the culture of the ability to learn and adopt these technologies. You called it the culture of agility. And uh, finally, the best thing that I liked uh, was your 70-30 rule, wherein you believe that 70% of all activity, or at least most of the important activities will get commoditized. And 30% is where you really need to think through, use your prompt engineering skills, strategic thinking, pattern recognition, etc. And finally, I think you, you gave a very important mantra, especially for the India ecosystem, wherein the point is not to try and ape the different things that are happening especially in the Western world, but to look at the core problems that the Indian uh, population has and use these technology, especially AI, Gen AI, to try and solve these problems uniquely for the India ecosystem. Uh, So, Professor Soni, it's really brilliant to be speaking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Great. To the audience, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We will back soon with another leader, with another academician on another interesting topic. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Business Resilience Series. Stay tuned for more such interesting episodes. You can listen to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from. To know more about Zenov, visit our website, www.zenov.com, or drop us a note at info at zenov.com. Follow us on Twitter at Zenov for regular updates on our content. Thank you again for listening to the Business Resilience Series of the Zenov Podcast.